as, as far as like, this might be number, like a sorry no, what is it number 20 holy geez the magic number 20 um that's fantastic i i appreciate people has anybody i wonder if, if anybody's come to all 20 um we should have a prize for that if there is such a person uh anyways welcome uh welcome back from a long weekend i hope you had a a good one um we got a really great presentation uh today so great speaker great commentators and it's my sincere pleasure to moderate this i don't normally do this Letitia's away um so i'm the backup moderator today but i'm certainly happy to do that for those of you i haven't met my name is david leg um, I'm a faculty member at Mount Royal University, and I'm one of the co-chairs and co-founders of the Calgary Adapted Hub. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, uh, Dr. Nancy Spencer. And Dr. Nancy Spencer is going to talk about inclusion still, understandings, assumptions, and some other possibilities. I love the open-ended nature of this and where, where, where it could go. And then we have two commentators who will uh, I'll introduce when we get to that point. And so uh, Dr. Spencer will speak for approximately 25 to 30 minutes, and then we'll have a chance for our two commentators who I will introduce at that time to provide some, some commentary, um, some kind of, kind of reflections on Dr. Spencer's presentation. And of course, we're always open to uh, input conversation um, from those that attend. And so you can either use the chat function, raise your hand, um, or if you want to have, you know, partake in the conversation, we're certainly happy to put you on the screen uh, towards the end as well. So Dr. Spencer, if you'll allow me, is a relational researcher and teacher in the areas of adapted physical activity in children and youth sport and recreation at the University of Alberta. She is committed to understanding what creates meaningful experiences in play, sport, both adapted and parasport, and recreation for all people, and specifically those who experience marginalization. Much of her scholarship engages with individuals who experience disability using qualitative methodologies through reflexive practice, openness to critique, and deliberate engagement with the needs, voices, and knowledge of communities. She hopes that her teaching and research with diverse humans and communities will contribute to a more socially just world. And so today's objectives for Dr. Spencer's presentation is A, to identify current understandings of inclusion, B, to critique assumptions underlying these current understandings of inclusion, and C, to examine other ways, other ways of understanding inclusion. Dr. Spencer, thank you for being our speaker today. Thank you for joining us. And then as far as the slides go, so Ashley and Jordan and Hannah, who I believe is sitting right beside you, Jordan, um, I guess it would just make sense, uh, Nancy, for you to just say next slide, and then they can turn the slide from there. So Dr. Spencer, I will turn it over to you. Great. Uh, thank you, David, for um, that warm introduction. And everyone can just call me Nancy. Um, <laughs> it would be preferable. Uh, so on the screen here, you have a picture of my treehouse. And I've actually written this part of my presentation because it's just important to get right. Uh, so early this morning, I stepped into my backyard. And as I do some mornings to enjoy the latte in my treehouse. It was intended normally, this treehouse was built for my kids, but it seems that I'm the one who enjoys it the most. And the moment I was fully out of the tree, out of the house, I was met with the fragrant purple blossom of the lilac tree that rose immediate outside the back door. Click. Our next slide. And then click again. And I felt particularly grateful for the freshness in the air amid what has been a very smoky last several days, but nowhere near as smoky and scary as it has been for people who reside closer to the fires. And I reflected on the privilege it is to live, work, and play alongside the land and the gifts of the land where I am a settler. The treehouse, the lilac tree, and my home and workplace at the University of Alberta are all located on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional lands of First Nations and Métis people. My acknowledgement of the land is a commitment to a way of living, thinking, and being in authentic ways and learning about the histories, meanings of the land, my responsibilities to the land, and my relational accountability, solidarity, and reciprocity with an Indigenous peoples. Next slide. 
So thank you uh, for coming to my presentation today. Um, I talk a lot about inclusion and it always seems like I'm putting dot, dot, dot uh, whenever I talk about inclusion because I really just view it as this forever unfinished thing that we need to keep challenging ourselves about in terms of how we understand it, the assumptions that we make and continue to try and imagine up new possibilities. Um, I've certainly had the experience of detailing my positionalities in my research, um, drawing on terms that associate me with race, gender, class, sexual orientation, and disability, among others, as well as identifying that the positionalities and identities that I hold carry deeply entrenched privileges. So I'm committed to work that involves questioning myself, my assumptions, and these privileges, and work that seeks social change leading to social justice. I'm heightened to the possibility that without critical analysis of these positionalities, I could unknowingly reproduce forms of oppression. And before moving through this presentation, I just wanted to acknowledge a few people who have had influence on my thinking and who have also been a part of some of these presentations in the past. So I actually saw Kirsten Kerwer on here, and so she will recognize aspects of this presentation, as well as Rebecca Rubuliak um, contributed to a lot of this thinking as well. Uh, next slide. You've gone too far. Uh, so I want to tell you a little bit about this story. When I was presenting uh, these kinds of ideas at the ISAPA conference in 2019 in Virginia. So I had presented and then afterwards was out in the hallway and a senior colleague in my area uh, came up to me and, and said, Oh, I've been doing reading some of your things and I just saw your presentation and and immediately I was filled with this like, oh my gosh, he's reading my stuff and he came to my presentation and he wants to talk to me about it. And then he said, you've gone too far. And then I had check, 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 self check, self check. Uh, okay, curiosity mode. Oh, uh, what do you mean? And um, the conversation went along where the ideas that I was presenting were taken to be personal critiques of individual work, um, not acknowledging the progress that we've made in the field of APA, and quite simply pushing back against things that we that the person thought we'd already resolved. And so after this conversation, I thought to myself, I don't think I've gone too far. <laughs> I think maybe I need to do a better job of explaining some of my thinking. Um, but it also made me think about the value of critique and assumptions um, and also uh, the idea of welcoming debate. Uh, next slide. So a few things I want to mention before I move into the presentation is I'm coming primarily from a relational model of disability. Uh, this sees disability as something that is dynamic and fluid. Uh, it occurs in social contexts. Uh, people may be disabled in one context and not in another. And it's largely based on the relationships that we form with each other. Uh, I acknowledge that some people might disagree with what I present and I'm cool with that. <laughs> um, I encourage you to be curious and I really welcome respectful debate. I think that's super important. Next slide. So why inclusion still? Uh, next slide. So despite inclusion being around for some time in our field, basically since the 1980s, it came in as this idea of a support-based approach, very person-first uh, forward. It was replacing integration, which was critiqued for the idea of acknowledging people in spaces, but not their experiences there. We still have issues. Next slide. So we continue to have ongoing reports of exclusion. If you look into the APA literature, it's plentiful of experiences that people have that are exclusionary, that don't recognize their differences, that other them, um, that don't lead to meaningful opportunities to authentically take part. Next slide. You can also read a lot about practitioners and teachers who talk about their ongoing struggles to try and be inclusive in their in their classrooms. Um, you know, we talk about or we hear about interventions and the use of Parasport and other different kinds of ways to encourage children to be more inclusive and to change attitudes. But at the end of the day, there are still so many reports where it's where teachers find it really challenging to include others. Next slide. 
there's some being written about this idea of specialized sport, what was termed segregated sport. Uh, some people are very for this idea of new and different spaces where people can choose to be with other people who they identify with. Some will argue against that, saying that it's segregation and it's actually removing choice. Um, some, will, some people will talk about separate spaces as healing spaces. So we have lots of disagreement and tension when it comes to this idea of separate space. Next slide. We also have the concept of reverse integration, where people with and without impairment will compete with and against each other in sport. Again, there's some opposition to this, mostly in the United States. It's pretty common in Canada to have this, but reverse integration and how that might operate as an inclusive space can be challenged. Next slide. Uh, next. Um, in the research, while this is um, definitely getting better, we can see that there are a lack of representation when it comes to participant voices and presence. Um, last year, I did a project with one of my colleagues, Dr. Gyozo Molnar, and we actually read every single article published in the Adapted Physical Activity Quarterly and uh, the European Adapted, UJAPA, European Journal of Adapted Physical Activity Quarterly. And there was only one article in all of them that basically had a participatory or community-based research lens to it. But the participants in that study were students. <laughs> they weren't actually people who experienced disability. So there's a really significant gap in the field of APA if you go by those two journals. Um, in terms of research that really meaningfully involves the perspectives of people who experience disability through all phases of research. Next. Uh, we have very few disabled researchers. Uh, another thing that we looked at in that project was to see if we could identify um, authors, researchers who were disabled research, who were disabled contributors um, to the literature. And we know this number is low because it relied on self-identification, but we had, I think it was approximately 10 in well over a thousand articles. And again, we know that's low, but we opted not to identify people for them because it's your right to self-identify. Um, but certainly we need to encourage uh, more researchers who have experience of disability. Next. Uh, and next. If you look across APA literature, there are not even a handful of articles that address intersectional perspectives. We know that disability as an identity is one of many marginalized experiences that people will have in their lives. And by not acknowledging how disability, gender, sexuality, social class, race, all of these things intersect, we don't do a good job of understanding how we can both create change as well as the experiences of the people that we are intending to serve through our research. And next. We have a general lack of coherence when it comes to the term inclusion and how people use it in our field. I don't think coherence is necessarily something we're meant to be um, achieving or we have to have, but we definitely need more clarity in terms of how people are describing inclusion. And if we're trying to create a body of research around a particular topic, having better inclusion and some coherence across what it is we mean by inclusion is also really important. So those are all good reasons <laughs> to continue to talk about inclusion from my perspective. Next slide. So what have uh, people been saying about inclusion and how they've come to understand it? So there is still, although this is from 1999, we still often talk about inclusion um, relative to the supports that people are receiving. So if someone's included, it means that they have the supports to be able to learn successfully. Next. Uh, the work of uh, Depa and Doltepper brought in some new perspectives around inclusion, not so much talking about it as just a strategy or an outcome, but they talked about it as this idea of an attitude or a process. Next. This also included the idea of um, a philosophical approach to implementing social justice. Primarily, they were talking about within schools, but we can think about this well beyond that to also include community. Next. 
and this idea that we now focus on the individual. So inclusion means that somebody must have choice and have choices. So it's not either this or that, but they have a multitude of choices to pick from. And next. Next. Okay. Um, some people will simply talk about inclusion as processes that promote participation. So it can be something very, very basic that whatever we do in a space that allows people to take part can count as something related to inclusion. So this could be strategies, this could be adapting, it could be setting up a social setting in a different kind of way, but any process that would promote participation could reflect inclusion. Next. Reed's definition from 2003 um, that basically everyone is welcome. So regardless of how somebody might be perceived as different or be different, the idea is that everyone can enjoy a particular space. And next. And this is, um, my name's there. Um, so when I did my PhD research. One of the things I was really aware of was there wasn't much written about children from their own perspectives. We tended to ask children's parents or we would use other forms of proxies and teachers to learn about their inclusive experiences. And so this reflects back the work of Stainbeck and Stainbeck, who talked about the importance of having a sense of belonging, a sense of acceptance and value. So really recognizing inclusion as a subjective experience. And next. So those are some ways our field has talked about inclusion, but there's got to be others. <laughs> and uh, one, some of the ways that we can go about doing this, certainly there's a host of literature that's outside of APA that really hasn't touched the field nearly enough. So for example, disability studies is an area that conceptualizes disability differently that could really inform our thinking about inclusion. Um, another thing is to actually interrogate the current discourses that we have, and I'm going to do a little bit of that today, question some of our assumptions, as well as engage with our axiology. So this is really about our human values. So what is the value that that's underneath all of what is driving your work? And axiology is almost like the first step from my perspective. Okay, what are your values and how does, how does that appear in your work that you do? Next. So you've probably seen this one. Um, I'm, I would be hard pressed to think somebody on this call has not seen this one. So this is how um, inclusion has often been represented, right? So we have this middle lovely circle where all these people get to be involved. And then on the outside of the circle, we notice, oh wait, hey, there's a whole bunch of people outside of this circle who aren't a part of it. And that's referred to as you know, exclusion. Integration, right, is that, that that group of people now gets to be within the circle, but they're within it within their own group. And then we have this idea of segregation. There's no relationship, but people could still experience something together. So people within this circle are in the inclusion space. People outside of the circle are segregated from it, but together. And then the representation of inclusion here is that all of a sudden everybody gets to be in the same space. And it's represented by this lovely circle um, where everybody gets to belong. Next slide. And you've probably come across some of these before too, um, trying to help us understand some of the different justice terminology that we come across. And so basically it sort of shows you what does reality actually look like? And it sort of differentiates between people's access to something right? Moving to equality. Okay, now everybody gets the same box to stand on. Equity, everybody gets to be at the same height. Justice, we've removed the barrier. But then inclusion here talks about these barriers are gone. Everybody gets to be involved, valued, and gets to play. But we're missing something in these pictures. Or, or there's something that's really representative in these pictures. It's this idea of a circle or a space that everyone is getting included in. And there's something privileged about this space that everybody should get included in. And while we interrogate some of the inclusion discourses, we often aren't interrogating the space that we're talking about as being the inclusive place. Next slide. So what if we questioned the privileged space? So simply by trying to include does not mean that we're being inclusive. Right? So if we imagine our privileged space as a gymnasium and a whole bunch of people are playing in the gym, 
just because we're trying to include people in there doesn't mean we're actually being inclusive. Next. And then there's this idea of like bringing people in, right? If you bring people in or you have the privilege of inviting them, that's actually a very othering kind of thing. If we say the gymnasium is the privileged space, it automatically means anything outside of that is the marginalized space or is on the margins. So we have to start rethinking this idea of privileged space because essentially it defaults to the idea then that some people are not part of that. And if you're not part of that, you're not either welcomed in or you're missing out. Next. So <laughs> we don't actually get closer to inclusion by continuing to welcome people into one space, we actually have to disrupt it by getting rid of this idea that we have this center, that we have this meaningful privileged space that everybody wants to be part of. We actually need to start um, pushing against that idea because that actually creates exclusion, right? Because if you're not here, then you're not in the privileged space. space. So we actually have to disrupt this idea of that center. Next. And what that really means is we have to question the normalized lens, right? So if we walk around anywhere in the world, we talk about creating more inclusive spaces out of the spaces that already exist. These spaces that already exist are the normalized spaces. And so there's a huge assumption underneath that idea of normalized space that's the best space, that it's the space everyone should be included into. But maybe part of the reason why inclusion is so hard is that that space isn't designed at its very core to be inclusive. So when you know inclusion first came about and we talked about it as the merging of special and general education, well, that really meant general education was the privileged space and there were gonna be some changes to it. It didn't actually create a new space. So we continued along with this normalized idea of what was important, uh, what was valued without questioning it. So maybe what we need to do is question the spaces that we currently have, as opposed to trying to adapt or modify them or include people in them. Because that invitation to be part of a privileged space is also recognizing that space as more valued. Next. So maybe we can consider new spaces of encounter. Um, I taught a grad class a number of years ago, and we started talking about this idea of heterotopia, or this idea of other spaces or counter sites. So this is not the normative space. These are actually other spaces, and we need to start thinking about what other spaces could look like. And next. So when we have an other space or a new space or a different space, it actually opens up possibilities for new kinds of encounters between people where we can talk about the normal and the abnormal, the familiar and the strange, but there aren't already assumptions about what's privileged in there. So I, I actually think these, this whole idea of inclusion as this circle, we need to disrupt the shape in terms of how we think about space. And next. So this new space, whatever it looks like, is transformative. And it's transformative in the ways that we think about what is useful, what is normal, what's healthy. We have a whole bunch of assumptions underlying disability and difference that are primarily negative and very exclusionary. So the idea of creating new and different space as opposed to trying to adapt and modify current normative space is something that would actually allow for different possibilities. And next. So essentially, it's a, it's a different way of organizing um, how we've created our lives, right? So, so rather than trying to make everybody fit one space, how do we actually generate new kinds of spaces where people's differences are allowed to be there and allowed to be and are valued? Next. So unfinished inclusion. So at the very core, when we think about inclusion, it has to be a value and not a strategy. So often um, people who are working in the field as practitioners are always looking at, okay, what are the strategies to include? What do I need to do? How do I need to adapt? I guarantee you, we can all learn the strategies, 
but that doesn't mean we can actually create an inclusive space because it goes much it goes way far beyond strategies of how to modify and adapt activities next so the the other important thing when we think about inclusion is it's so often used as a term that essentially others people Right? We often talk inclusion is for this special group of people, this different group of people. And in APA, we're often talking about people who experience disability, but inclusion actually shouldn't be something that is reserved for an other because it others. We actually need to think about it much bigger than that. So it's another point of disruption. And next. So inclusion also, and this ties into the idea of heterotopia, it has to be something different from the norm. If we're actually going to be successful in having inclusive spaces, they can't just simply reproduce what we already have. We can't just have our spaces and modify a little bit here and there. I think we actually need to have a new undercurrent that disrupts what we've had so we can generate something different. And next. Uh, so the idea is that inclusion isn't change. Inclusion isn't adapted. It's actually something that's unfinished um, that will continue to grow and change as we learn more. So that doesn't mean we throw out everything that we know, um, but continuing to think about it as change from what is the norm keeps it tied to the norm, keeps it tied to that value. And so it's really important that we actually push against that idea. And next, uh, not far enough. <laughs> We can't go far enough, really, with the idea of something being unfinished. We need to continue to question. We need to come up with ideas. We need to challenge. And those things need to also be really welcome. So when we think about um, our normative space, like I always have my students do this. I, we talk about inclusion, and I put up that slide that's got the circles and people on the inside and the outside. And I said, what other shape could you do? And you know, people are doing triangles and rectangles. And, and I always think of like, having a, a, a dash mark on the circle where people can flow in and out and that we actually have a whole bunch of circles. And what makes them not privileged is that they're all valued. Because one of the problems we have with adapted sport, for example, you could say, oh, well, we've generated something new in adapted sport, but it's not as privileged as the normative space, right? Because we're still talking about it being adapted. But if all spaces were somehow different, then we wouldn't have to worry about the privileging of one space or over another. And then people could fluidly move in and out of spaces that suited them, that they wanted to have choice over. So yeah, we haven't gone far enough. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. I, I still wanna call you Dr. Spencer, but I'll, I'll go with <laughs> Nancy as, as per your request. That was awesome. I, um, I was at, your presentation in Virginia uh, at ISAPA. And I'm familiar with many of the names that you shared in Martin Block's article from 1999, which I still use in the teaching of my own adapted physical activity class mm -hmm. as far as, you know, did we jump on the wrong bandwagon? And I would agree, we have not gone, or you have not gone, we have not gone far enough um, in the conversation about inclusion. And I'm, I'm fascinated to see where the conversations go. But before we do that, uh, please allow me to introduce our two uh, connectors, our two advisors, our two commentators that are gonna take a chance, first crack, at providing some reflections on your presentation. And I would certainly encourage those that are not the two that I'm going to introduce in a second here to still participate by adding comments into the chat function and or raising your hands and then following the, the comments um, by our commentators will we'll perhaps have a few minutes to engage in more of a conversation. So if you'll allow me, uh, please let me introduce our two commentators. And the first is Amanda Ebert. Uh, Amanda is a recreation and physical activity consultant with the Quality Fitness and Recreation in Edmonton. And she's been supporting individuals and families experiencing disabilities to find meaningful movement experiences in their communities for nearly 20 years and holds a master's and bachelor's degree from the University of Alberta. Amanda travels around the capital region to meet people in their homes, recreation center, parks and programs to support them to be active in the way they choose. Amanda is also a regular undergraduate course instructor at both the University of Alberta and Concordia University of Edmonton and is grateful for the time she gets to learn alongside Dr. Spencer with teaching and research opportunities. 
And before I pass it over uh, to Amanda, let me also introduce our second commentator, who's Sierra Roth, who also graduated from the University of Alberta with a Bachelor of Science in Kinesiology degree and now supports others living with disabilities and becoming physically active through Active Living Alliance for Canadians with Disability, the Stedward Centre, One Ability, and Ocean Rehab and Fitness. In 2021, Sierra hopped on the Bowhead Reach and competed in the first ever adapted mountain bike category at the Dunbar Summer Series, and soon after began the process of becoming a certified instructor. In the spring of 2022, she debuted a flow retreat with Kootenai Adaptive for women experiencing disability and had 11 women on adapted mountain bikes participate in the forest in Squamish, British Columbia. Realizing how much freedom she has found in her love of movement and getting outdoors, she hopes to help others build confidence in doing the same both on and off the trails with varying disability organizations. You know, if nothing else, it's always fascinating to talk about language because I had, I was kind of smirking to myself as I said the word adapted about four or five times in the introductions of our two, uh, our two commentators. So Amanda or Sierra, do any of you wish to provide your thoughts first? Can I just simply get you to raise a hand if you're willing to go first and then we'll, we'll do it that way. Whatever you're comfortable with, Sierra. Yeah, Amanda, you can jump in if you want. <laughs> you're going to defer back to each other, are you? Back and forth. Um, Amanda, I'd love to hear your thoughts on Nancy's presentation. Yeah, well, as David mentioned in the intro, I'm very privileged myself in many, many different ways and, and able to work with Nancy and have conversations about things like this on a fairly regular basis. And um, this is one of the really beautiful things about the position I'm in now where I get to still be connected with the academic side of things. And then I'm very much on the ground um, working with individuals in the community uh, for a lot of hours every week and getting to learn alongside them as well. And then bridging these things together and seeing how the ideas bump, how they how they merge and how one really informs the other one. So I, I, I agree wholeheartedly with with all of the, the comments that Nancy made, I don't think we have gone far enough. I think we need to stop thinking about inclusion as, as this checklist that once it's done, then we as professionals are the ones who get to say our programs are inclusive. And I think that's a, a big point for me I keep trying to stress with, with a lot of people that I interact with around the community is that we as the able-bodied practitioners are not the ones who get to say that our program is inclusive ever. We don't get to say that. That is not up for us to, de to decide that. We can say, here's all the steps that we are doing in order to try and foster an inclusive space. Here are the barriers we're, we're tackling. Here is what we're willing to do. Here's actually the things we don't have the resources to do or where we're actually lacking. Um, and so that people can make the decision on their own whether or not a, a space, a program, whatever it might be, is, is inclusive from their perspective as, as a subjective thing. Um, as a professional as well, I find that, that this is really, we need to be welcoming all this critique. Um, we need to be staying very, very curious and especially about ourselves. Like I would say my practice has shifted dramatically <laughs> over especially the last decade, the way I approach certain situations, the way I uh, view the world, what I value, um, the way that I've connected with my own ableism and how that has driven me to, to act as a professional in the community. So really confronting our own ableism and, and challenging our own assumptions. And when I go just thinking a little bit more, of, you know, taking it out of the, the deeper thinking and coming back into the grassroots, what I find I'm loving right now is learning from each individual person. So I, I'm not doing a lot of group programs. I'm doing individual stuff. So I could sit with people and say, what is a meaningful movement experience for you? What do you want to be doing? Um, what is preventing that from happening? And then how can we get there? And it isn't those, those, things, those strategies we talk about around, I need visuals that are at the programs. I need a ramp to be sure I can get into the building. That's not generally what people say. It's the, the social and the emotional connections that they are, are lacking and not feeling that true sense of belonging when they go to certain spaces. So they can get in the door so that it's integrated in that sense, but that really seems to be the big barrier. With children, it's actually parents who are feeling that. I find it a lot. The children may or may not, I haven't talked to all of them or about this, but the parents are often scared 
to try new places and to go new places. So I find it in the process of, of supporting families to engage in activity in the community. It's a lot of kind of two fronts, supporting the, the parents, learning what they need, um, learning what their perceptions are and their assumptions are as well. And then the, the kiddo themselves and working with that, um, with, with those levels. What I love to do now is kind of bridge, I guess, in a way, um, between people being at home and wanting to go somewhere else. So if someone says to me, I really want to go to Ninja Warrior training, instead of them just going and trying and it maybe not being a positive experience, then what I'll do is go ahead of time, I'll scout out the place, I'll take pictures, I'll make sure the staff knows this individual's name um, so they can get greeted by name when they go in. I'll prepare a social story if that's what somebody might need. I'll use all those strategies, but that labors on me and not the individual. Um, so I think just, those are just a, a few things on the kind of the frontline day-to-day -day stuff, but it's really driven by all of this thinking that that is coming, like that Nancy has shared with us. Thank you, Amanda. Sierra, am I able to ask you to respond to either Amanda's comments related to Nancy's presentation or just directly to Nancy's presentation? And then again, following Sierra's comments, open it up to conversation, comments, feedback. Yeah, when I was, well, it's interesting. So Nancy was one of my profs at U of A and a lot of this terminology really started to, you know, spark my questioning within this space. Um, I guess when I was in university, I was really questioning even just my internalized ableism um, and how that shows up in these different spaces. Um, so it's interesting for me because it comes from a perspective of I've experienced a lot of these different spaces, whether they're segregated, both positive and negative segregated spaces, um, some reverse integrated spaces, and all of them have been very beneficial to me in my growth and in movement um, and in sport. And it's interesting to me that there's always these critiques to these spaces because I've found them super beneficial in different ways, but also just learning from them and how do I apply that into the work that I do now? Uh, because like Amanda, I see a lot of people in different spaces, whether that's um, individual or group, and they all value whether they're segregated or not um, or integrated. They all value those experiences and it's a matter of figuring out what's the best approach for when they want to show up and how they want to show up best. Um, and then another interesting thing is I'm usually in Victoria, but I'm actually out in Salmon Arm right now um, on the territory of the Sweat Rock people. And I went to a sweat ceremony this past weekend and just the approach of how to make me feel like I belong in a space that in retrospect wasn't very accessible, um, was just them asking me questions, people asking me questions of how do I best show up for myself and how do I just be who I am in that space um, was pretty meaningful and made me realize like, yeah, I can appear in all of these different spaces, whether um, it's accessible or not, but because the people came together and asked questions and you know, gave that time to figure out what best way for me to be in that space was, was something that was uh, pretty powerful for me and reminded me of what inclusion could look like, regardless of what the space is. Um, so those are a couple of different my thoughts. And Nancy, I love the idea of many circles and the, you know, the dotted lines, um, because I think about specifically in the mountain bike space, um, I run these flow retreats, also very segregated considered segregated. Um, but also I've had a lot of comments that again, like Nancy said, are healing spaces where everyone can show up as themselves uh, because we all have a similar experience. And I also wonder if they're healing in the sense that I am also coaching and facilitating from that also that lived experience. Um, so there's power in that, but I always encourage them to go out into their communities and ride with friends, um, able-bodied friends, um, and in those spaces so that they have those different experiences. It doesn't always have to be at a flow retreat. They can go out and work with their trail societies to make things more accessible so that they can just show up in those spaces. And so Nancy, I love that analogy because that's that's usually what I try to pass on to people and explain to people. And it, it almost is like a barrier to them to think about it looking like that where they always have to come and show up into these programs and into these facilitated spaces when really they they belong outside in the community like everyone else does so yeah thank you nancy on that one thank you sierra um so again people are welcome to provide comments questions 
uh, raise their hands in the chat function. But I do, I want to pursue a couple of questions if I may. Um, so Nancy, you talked about reimagining spaces. I've been teaching at Mount Royal for 25 years now and in the adapted space. And I'd like to think that I've tried to reimagine, but I'm doing basically the exact same thing that I've been doing for 25 years. Um, insofar as going to a lecture theater and presenting a lecture and then doing some act like, and so we talk about reimagining spaces, but can you give me, can you give me an example of where someone's done that and created something new that from where it hasn't already existed and we've tried to include within that existing space? Um, well, I, I think you're hitting on a few things. So like doing the same thing for 25 years, like I get that. Like that's what I feel like the inclusion literature is like yelling at us. Same thing, same thing. You know, I've got some stuff to publish still that's the same thing, same thing. Um, so that really resonates strongly. Um, and, you know, the whole idea of like examples of something different. Um, certainly like there's people who are writing in, in other fields um, that are talking about different ways of people forming relationships. And we have this over-reliance on the idea of a big space that is inclusive. And that's not to say we still aren't charged with making what exists more inclusive for people. Like for example, um, in my APA course, um, there are ways that you can um, introduce accessibility into the class that is different than we've previously done. Like that goes beyond the whole idea, like we're gonna have closed captions, checkbox, right? Um, but but trying to create safe spaces that go well beyond that. I think there are some um, stories and examples that can be provided to students so that they can start to see themselves um, in some of the work and where they might have needs. Um, but there's some interesting work in transformational justice, in particular, um, the writing of disability activist Mia Mingus. Um, she's done some really interesting around, things around the concept of pods. Um, and how we can actually form smaller inclusive pods uh, for people that meet them where they are using some of the words that Sierra talks about, um, you know, be who you are, um, welcomed how you are. And then also, you know, Amanda going out into the community to like up the chances of an inclusive experience for sure. someone. Um, so this whole notion of pod creation is, is kind of an interesting one. And it's not about making your whole classroom more inclusive. It's about generating some new and inclusive spaces um, where people can find home. And, and we have multiple pods, all of us do in our lives. Um, and I would say, you know, like Amanda's in my, in my work inclusion pod, right? Like she's a person who um, has my back, who I can count on, who understands me. And, and that's largely what we hear from, from people when they talk about their experiences. Like, I can't be myself and I don't have someone to count on. And so I think that concept of pods is actually a, an innovative way to think about how we might generate inclusive spaces, but on a much smaller scale. Um, so it, it doesn't necessarily tackle the big, big space issue, but I think it can actually create safe space that might allow people to be within bigger spaces. Um, yeah. So yeah, one thing, sorry, David. Yeah, one thing that we have started um, here as well as I, I was finding I had a bunch of youth between like 18 and 27 who were, you know, at age out of all the pediatric supports and kept saying that they didn't fit anywhere. They didn't have friends. They didn't have a program to go to. Um, essentially that they're not the, the right kind of disabled for adapted programs and didn't quite fit into all of our, our normal bubbles out there. So we created our own. Um, I sat down with each of them individually and then sat down with them all together. And we're now at one year of this, we meet twice a month, this social group are going to karaoke tomorrow because that's what they want to do. They make all the decisions. Um, I again, going to make sure that like, there's sometimes they choose something and I have to call around before I pick the exact one that I think is going to be successful with the right attitudes from staff and the safe environment and things like that. And it's, yeah, between eight and 12 people. And that's just a recent, exi like tangible example that, that we've done recently. And it's just been such a success and such a joy to watch them all form their own pod to our, our text group is quite entertaining. You get, you get a lot of different things popping up there and 37 missed messages in five minutes and things like that. So it's just a really neat to see how, how they've all come together and, and really feel that sense of belonging. But we had to create that on our own so we could even go out into other spaces to be part of it. 
So the pods is, is so critical, so critical. And I presume the pods allows for a range within the inclusion segregation uh, uh, spectrum insofar as, you know, you could be segregated in one setting, but included in another and integrated in another. And those are all okay at various times. Is that? Absolutely. I think just as, as both Sierra and Nancy said, if we have those dashed lines around those circles, right, there's times like, like Sierra mentioned, you're going to want to be in a, in a separate kind of physical activity program. And then there's other times you're going to not, and all of those need to be okay. Well, and there's that song that has the tagline waiting on the world to change. I think it's like a John Mayer song or something, but I, but you know, I always just think to myself, like, like you can't let all the people who are experiencing marginalization wait until we get it right. Like, um, excuse my language, but the other day, Amanda and I were meeting with that, another person and, and it, like the idea was like, how do we come up with something less shitty? Um, like, you know, <laughs> as we try, sorry, but as we try to get to something that actually feels good. And, mm. and so, you know, like there's no, let's wait until we get it right. There's a like, you know, trying to discover ideas and ways in which people can experience inclusion, but do that in multiple spaces. So, you know, you could actually move across these dashed lines in your pod um, so that you can be in an integrated setting, but with people, your close people who've got your back, who, where you can be who you are, because it's quite often that sense of isolation um, that people experience in larger spaces that, then you know leads to complete disengagement and withdrawal. David, you're talking about changing, you know, things that have been the same for 20, 25 years. Well, a lot of a lot of people on here are practitioners in the field. And I ask you, like, think about what are the policies at some of your organizations? You know, if somebody is living with chronic health or just not having a good day and doesn't want to come, does that mean that there's a financial consequence to that? Right. It, like what are the rules around absences are you requiring that they have an aid for support or a parent well then now that's actually put another barrier on the family you know is is your did you notify people when your elevator is broken or your lift isn't working and does your lift actually fit in the change rooms i'm sorry that's a real thing there's a lift but you can't get from the change room to the pool anyway that's a don't get me going on that kind of stuff, but there's things like that out there that I think we need to be thinking about ourselves. Are, are you still split into only chronological age with a flexible or a very, very firm December 31st is the cutoff and that's the end of the story, right? Like we, right. we continue to do things that keep spaces exclusionary without thinking about it. So I think even some of those, like questioning some of those things, do you have to be in the classroom all the time? Right. right? I think those are important for us to do as practitioners as well. It and does, is the pushback to that just the, the pragmatic practicality of it? We just don't have the capacity to deal with that. We don't have the... Why don't we have the capacity? That's, that's the stuff. Why don't we have the funding? That's not an excuse anymore. I'm sorry. Like We keep saying those things over and over. We have to do things different. We can't just say there's no, there's no money. We can't. You know, it's too expensive to fix the lift. You know, those things are not valid excuses anymore. Well, how do we... You're not putting money into things where it's really valued. Therefore, inclusion is not really valued in your space. Right. right? There's a question for you to ask the people that come to your door in the next couple of weeks leading up to the provincial election, perhaps, is uh, you know, what 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 are their what are their perspectives and policies and attitudes towards inclusion? Anyways, I, I digress. Ashley, you're about to say something. Yeah, and actually, because this question, um, as soon as Nancy said the quote, I was really hoping that both Sierra, Amanda, and Nancy could comment on this as um, you know, as the Calgary Adapted Hub looks to provide quality experiences for children and youth experiencing disability in our communities, um, we are, you know, a lot of our program partners come from very typical settings in sport and recreation. So we use a lot of what we know from the past. So I heard choice being a really key piece of that. Um, but the inclusion is a value and not a strategy. If we want to check our assumptions, especially as a collective or as a collaborative, to ensure that we're doing that best. Um, do you have other any advice to make sure that um, the value piece is really what's prominent or maybe an example of where you've seen that shift for organizations and for collectives 
so that we actually can, you know, you know, we're honoring that as part of the process um, and getting away from the check boxes and the strategies and the things that often draw our attention or take away a lot of our focus. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, yeah, one of the things I would also say about these typical sport and recreation organizations, they're, they're very exclusive, even for the people who, for whom they were designed. Um, like, like bil ability is a really exclusionary concept, never mind, you know, when we talk about disability, um, for sure. Um, I think, you know, some of the things Amanda mentioned at the outset, like there are policy related things that we often just don't even think about. Um, but, but I think the great example we just saw was when David talked about practicalities and then Amanda said, wait, what that that's that's a capacity thing and then like so it's actually asking the harder question like it's there's the first line and and i get this because you know in, in my class like accommodations and things like that like it, it's pushing my capacity to be able to to do my job but okay then there's some work i need to do somewhere else like because if it's all falling on one person that's a big problem so if it's all falling on your organization that's a big problem because it's you know sort of everybody's responsibility, um, but Amanda, can I get you to talk to the organizational piece? Because I know you work with a bunch of organizations and would experience this exact thing. Yeah, we've actually been in, in discussion with somebody about this. It came from a, a Facebook group with a bunch of parents, um, and basically the discussion was saying, "There's nothing here. There's nothing here. There's nothing here. All these programs don't work for all these reasons. Am I looking for a unicorn?" So. I thought that was really cool. And I've actually reached out to the parents and said, hey, let's get together and let's pull in the, the municipality that you're in and let's create a unicorn. Like, so you tell me, what do you need? Why, not, not even just why do all these programs not work, but you're talking about creating a unicorn and that seems to be the only space that's gonna feel good for your kids. Well, what does that look like? What, what is your unicorn? And then we can say, and the municipality can say, well, that's not feasible for this reason. And then we can dive into that. And, you know, maybe this, so we're literally calling it the unicorn program and it's developed from the community. Like the community is, is I'd love us to find a grant so they can actually get paid for some of their time for all of this. So instead of us saying, you know, here's, here's the kind of model we want to put out, or here's what our current grant tells us we have to be doing. Um, who, who can we be asking and who's not in this space? Can we find out why they're not coming to the space and then have them actually tell you what the program needs to look like. And, and I've been where you are, Ashley, many, many times. You, know, you try your best to, to create something that's gonna be good for so many people, and, and but we keep doing it the same process that we've always done and then it just doesn't work. Sierra, and in the uh, flow group, um, what, what kind of um, like participation do your participants have in terms of designing program and things like that? Yeah, I've been challenging this one a little bit because um, we have organizations now reaching out that want to like integrate our adaptive space and put them into, you know, able-bodied mountain bike spaces. And yeah, that's one of the things I continuously like challenge um, with people. And, you know, what, what does that look like? How much do we want to participate? How much do we still want to stay within our own group? Um, yeah. And I, I go always go back to asking, I mean, a lot of the women that we serve with the flow retreats, it, they feel included, um, but I'm still constantly questioning them on like, what could be better? Um, and, you know, cause I live that, that space too. I start, start questioning, like, how could this actually work better? How does it work better when I'm not in this group? Um, those kinds of things. But the other thing too is, I mean, the parasport space for me was pretty exclusionary in terms of like they whether I wanted to be grassroots to high performance, they always pushed the high performance and never really let me dabble in the grassroots space. Um, and I never really saw any coaches that were disabled. And so at the Stedward Center, we're starting Athletes to Coaches 2.0. And I guess our main goal out of that is to make the coaching pathway as individual as possible and it's asking those same questions of what do you need to be a coach what are the skills that you still want to learn rather than designing a whole program that might not fit for somebody because the pathway is different for every single individual in that and so how do we what does that look like um we'll be starting that so that's a pitch on my end if you want to be involved in that as well to get more people into leadership and coaching roles well, well, see, that's a great that's a great sales pitch nancy sorry i i need to i need to sum up um, yeah, go for 
we've hit the end of our time. Uh, clearly, we could spend a lot longer chatting about this. Uh, this is an important topic, and I very much appreciate our three speakers for joining us today. Um, I know I've seen on the, the chat, uh, there was a request to know about the, the recordings for this. It will be available on the Calgary Adaptive Hub Powered by Jumpstart's website on its YouTube channel. So Amanda, Sierra, and Nancy will be trending shortly. Um, so you can you can tell all your friends you've become YouTubers now. And I now, Ashley, do we have our next one scheduled for our, our next online seminar? Uh, we will take a break uh, now until September. Um, but again, maybe just here, if we're doing sales pitches, um, we would love for you to join our newsletter uh, because that's also a great way that we can continue to hear from you. Um, we do want the community to be part of this design. And especially when it comes to the research and knowledge translation portion, how do we make sure that that's not exclusive either, that we have the integration running through all the Calgary Adapted Hub Powered by Jumpstart um, committees, as well as then broadly into this larger committee um, and collective that's working across the country. So mm -hmm. yeah, maybe join the newsletter. We'll send out the YouTube link. Um, and then, yeah, we will we'll fire everything back up again in the fall. Thank you, Ashley. And I just want to finish on Kirsten's comment there. Keep disrupting. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's a great way to finish today. Thank you again to our three speakers. Thank you to all of you for joining us today. And have a great summer. And we'll see you back here in September. Great. Thanks for having me.